Sweet. So let's get started. Um, just quick intros. Thanks everyone for uh, showing up and uh, look forward to uh, having, it's, I wanted this to be more like a two-way conversation, so we're going to go through the deck uh, fairly quickly, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes tops, and then uh, spend some time uh, doing Q&A and kind of having a conversation. Uh, so I'm Chino Sahu. I'm an IT architect in IBM based at RTP. Um, and I'll let Bill introduce himself. Hi, I'm Bill Hankard. I'm based out of the Littleton Mass Lab. So I'm a Boston native and I work with Chino. So just to kind of, uh, well, what you guys can expect from the session, um, and you'll get some more details on the context of uh, what we do within IBM. It's basically um, our internal cloud. It's our internal way of enabling our development teams that are actually building and delivering products and services, offerings, uh, making sure they have what they need uh, to do that in an effective, uh, efficient, cost-effective way, co manner. Um, so what we want to kind of share today is what sort of challenges we had while operating this global, hybrid, multi-cloud service, uh, what those challenges were, and then how we addressed them. Um, and so just a little bit of context, uh, around 2015 or so, uh, we had a mission to <clears throat> enable our development teams, uh, kind of two fundamental business objectives. Um, ensure that they're able to seamlessly move workload and uh, work and operate and build their software in both uh, an on-premise uh, cloud and in our public cloud, uh, which is software, um, and also allow them to deliver continuously and um, in a DevOps type way. I think on one of those topics, and we try to enable the developer, so we kind of get the IT out of the way, and that's where we found OpenStack very beneficial for us. They're self-enabled, they have the resource, they can go forward and be productive. Yep, it's a great point, Bill. Very much self-service, API-driven, that, that's definitely the, the key. Um, so this is a really, uh, it's a busy picture slide, but it kind of shows some of the technologies and tools that uh, are included. And, and we're going to go into a little bit more detail, but you'll see OpenStack on the top left. Um, we're leveraging Jenkins, uh, Grafana, that were tied into Slack and uh, GitHub, and, and a couple other corporate tools that, you know, the company, that our company uses as, as well. Um, what we ended up trying to do is not just do OpenStack. You know, it's OpenStack as the base, but we kind of think of it as OpenStack plus as a service. Um, and so listed here are all the things that we've built around and on top of OpenStack. Um, we want to make sure there's a consistent user experience. Uh, we've built a way to do automated image replication, uh, an engine for users to go build their custom images and get, have them pushed out to each cloud, uh, custom DNS registration, uh, hybrid networking to and from our public cloud, uh, automated security compliance, um, we've got a lot of corporate security tools that we've got to integrate with, uh, a corporate directory, uh, multiple platform support. Um, we, we've got a significant investment in power, um, and we're enabling containers as well. Uh, automated uh, continuous business need and other like business processes. Um, and so these are kind of the things that we could focus on because OpenStack solved a lot of the other things that you know we didn't have to invest in. So the focus was building above the stack and around it to really uh, impact our users. Uh, so here's a, another busy diagram, just kind of our high-level architecture. On the right, you'll see um, our on-premise footprint. Um, you know, right today, we're fuel-managed OpenStack, um, open source um, fuel, open source uh, Mirantis' distro, um, using Spectrum Scale, which is uh, otherwise known as GPFS, as storage, open vSwitch for networking. Uh, and then the stack light monitoring stack for, for uh, kind of uh, monitoring availability and, and operations and, and, and et cetera. And the, just one point, the Spectrum Scale is a clustered backend file service that IBM's had for years and integrates fairly well into OpenStack. Um, and you'll see in the bottom right some of the things we, you know, we've got to integrate with, our corporate tool, uh, corporate, corporate ticketing, corporate authentication, um, our chargeback mechanism. Um, and then on the left, uh, you'll see uh, the footprint that we have in software. We've got uh, a Bluemix dedicated environment that you know, we're integrated into uh, from a connectivity perspective. 
Um, and this is an instance dedicated to IBM internal. It's not our public Bluemix, but we do have cases where we go out to public Bluemix as well. Um, so I won't get into any more details there. Um, so let's jump right into some of the challenges that you know we faced while uh, building and operating uh, the service. So obviously, there's with any cloud provider, you're going to have costs. Um, cost is one of the key constraints. Um, you know, we kept adding on more complexity, uh, which resulted in more costs. Uh, our support costs went went um, went up um, as we onboarded more users. We have a global footprint. Um, Four major sites today, uh, two in the US, one in Canada, and one in the UK, and we're, we're going to expand that uh, even further. Um, <clears throat> as with any cloud, you're going to have um, cases where you're not fully utilizing all your resources. So um, we you know, hit that as well with our OpenStack-based solution, um, where teams and users just aren't being responsible. Um, and you know, how do we address that and how do we, um, what do we do to help them be more responsible and optimize their use at the same time, uh, get the most of what they're doing at, uh, at, at, at the lowest cost possible. Uh, and then I want to speak a little, talk a little about how we optimize enabling these teams. Um, Bill had mentioned um, IT was kind of seen as a gate, as a, um, as a manual step in a process for our developers. We wanted to eliminate that completely and, and really put the power in their hands um, and make sure that they're um, able to do what they need to do, but in a safe, controlled, efficient manner without um, you know, them crashing the car, per se. Uh, so we'll jump right into uh, anything you want to add. Bill? Yeah, no, I just you know as Chino said, the you know the self enablement of the of the end user was key and paramount to. They have their own networking, they have their own images. They're basically in their own project doing it, and we're stepping back, just providing the infrastructure for them. That was a key component. Yep. Um, so rising costs from adding complexity. You know, one of our key things that we needed, we know we needed to do was standardize. I um, mean, it's pretty obvious. You know. The more standardization you do, the the less uh, <clears throat> um, variations you have, and hence, when everyone's working on in a, in, a, in a in the same way, heading on the same mission, then you gain efficiencies doing that. But you know, we've got a heterogeneous uh, data centers across the world. Um, you know, we knew standardizing at the harbor layer wasn't going to be um, possible and something that we could tackle, and so that's where OpenStack really helped us. Is it helped us standardize at that layer, that infrastructure as a service layer. Um, and so we've got a recipe where we're you know, leveraging the same storage technology, same networking technology, same configuration. And, and we've automated all that so we can literally stand up a cloud in um, a day or less you know, and, and roll it out into production um, very quickly. Um, and that kind of leads me to this last point here. Um, we built a way to incrementally roll out features. Um, so. One of the shifts we had with our user base was, you know, they traditionally been um, used to like the VMware base model, where they would get a bunch of VMs and they would kind of hold on to them and they would craft them into uh, these snowflakes. And we wanted to, and then they trusted that these VMs would always be there. When we kind of shifted to this OpenStack-based uh, service, you know, the message we conveyed was. We're not going to guarantee that your workload is going to be up all the time, or that it's going to exist. We could have a cloud failure. We could have a hypervisor failure. So we wanted to drive them to build their code, build their processes around expecting failure. And so our guarantee was that we would have OpenStack services up. There would always be an OpenStack cloud, whether it's in the one in RTP, the one in the UK, or the one in Canada. Uh, you're always going to have an OpenStack service, but you won't necessarily have uh, your workload. That exact workload uh, it was not guaranteed to be up all the time. And that kind of really <clears throat> forced our users to kind of redefine, re look at the process and build that sort of uh, failover uh, mindset into, the, into their process. Um, and, and we do that as well you know, when we're trying to roll out features. You know, we, we expect things to fail. So when they do fail, we're able to recover quickly. Um, and then minimize any impact uh, because of that. Um, so rising, rising costs from support. Um, you know, there's, OpenStack is complex. There's things that happen that uh, you know, are difficult to debug and 
Uh, one of the models we chose to go with is instead of purchasing formal support from a vendor, uh, we chose to invest in people. So we scaled up people across our teams uh, to become OpenStack experts and uh, kind of self-support our service. And we've realized uh, from that, you know, we were able to really build strong um, technical people. And we, I think we resolved issues faster. I mean, yeah. historically, yeah. Um, we've had uh, vendor support for other um, offerings. And <clears throat> usually it takes, you know, you know, it's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of uh, overhead with that. Um, but and, we, and so far, we found that having our people um, support the offering versus yeah, I think collaboratively better. throughout the IT team we have skills various skills everywhere and we found that that really helped in this whole global model of deploying and supporting OpenStack moving forward so having those diverse skills within Python scripting hardware software storage networking technologies really helped us immensely yep and it's all about collaborating I mean we were all we're all in a slack channel we are multiple slack channels and you know, we're, we're constantly keeping our, each other uh, abreast of what's going on. Um, and because we have a global team, we're able to kind of do this follow the sun model where uh, teams will pick up where, when, when days end here in the US and, and vice versa. Um, Well-built runbooks, um, can't underemphasize that, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and that includes automation, automation and well-documented steps on, on what you, our admins need to do in order to debug and address issues. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, we leverage our clouds as, as kind of failover instances. When something does go wrong, uh, we, we've built in a way to quickly shift users to another cloud or another um, region or uh, availability zone, et cetera. So, you know, they're, they're not impacted while we continuously debug um, where issues do arise because OpenStack is as, as, as all of you probably are well aware, is very sensitive and can go down at any point. And I think the standardization part was also is a key point from being able to debug people's, you know, the other environments across the, the globe that we've ha had issues with. So if we know it's cookie cutter across the, across the IBM, then it's easier for the teams to debug and fix problems when they arise. Yep. You know where to go and what to expect. <laughs> Uh, so usage governance, just kind of helping users uh, be more responsible and um, giving them the tools to kind of self-police, self-monitor themselves. Um, automation, you know, we've invested a ton of automation. Uh, CBN, making sure that they still need their resources uh, for the allotment that they, you know, ask for those resources, kind of pruning and kind of self-cleaning projects and um, cleaning out volumes, et cetera. Um, that's something that we, we definitely re rely heavily on. Um, and we built a dashboard that uh, is user facing. It kind of shows them this is what they're consuming across all their clouds, both on-prem and in soft layer, um, in public cloud, what they're being you know, charged for. You know, this is what you're spending. And then just simply just having that data and understanding where their costs were and the ability to kind of model out, well, if I shifted uh, 10% of my workload from public cloud to um, on-prem, this is how my bill will get, you know, will, will be impacted. You know, just having that information, that data, really drove a lot of their behavior to, you know, kind of think about uh, being more responsible and, and making the right decisions to optimize their cost. Um, and in other cases, you know, where you need public cloud for some reasons, and, and not, but just understanding what, it, what the trade-offs are and what they're paying for, um, really help kind of drive some of that uh, behavior. Um, and then really kind of focusing on enabling these teams to be self-service, to be more um, empowered to take on uh, more of the IT type uh, tasks. Um, education was definitely key. Uh, we have a really well-defined automated onboarding process. Um, and then we spent a lot of time kind of really consulting with these teams and kind of showing them how to use OpenStack and how to use uh, automation, uh, develop infrastructure as code, um, enabling these coaches to kind of teach uh, other people on their team, um, providing them tools. Um, we've got a central Jenkins instance. Uh, we've got a lot of Ansible playbooks and, and, and heat templates that uh, they're able to use and 
um, kind of take off the shelf and then customize and, and leverage on their own. And really the shift from static to dynamic, um, that's really the, the, the mantra that we wanted to push was uh, get out of this uh, old uh, model of using static VMs and static workload and um, doing things when they need to on demand and, and, and in a dynamic way. Do you want to add? Yeah, I would say that the, we've found that you know the dynamic uh, deployment of instances has really gone up dramatically when a user realizes that they don't need to keep it around forever and maintain it. And a lot of the workload automation that runs out there is constantly being redeployed every day. Uh, thousands of instances created up and down. So we see a high not volume in that area. Um, and so kind of the results of, of, the, of addressing these challenges. Um, so, you know, we can do, we can roll out a new cloud in half the time we used to. We can roll out new features in, in half the time that we used to. We're able to provide uh, 24 by 7, near 24 by 7. It's not full 24 by 7, but it's close uh, without having to, you know, hire third shift employees. Um, you know, we've enabled users to optimize their consumption patterns. Um, and, and again, in a more self-service way, uh, we've reduced our overall TCO by 30%, and, and there's definitely some savings to be had uh, uh, because of OpenStack and, and all the things that we've, we've kind of done with OpenStack. Um, so that's basically it. Let's uh, want to spend some time with some q and A. I I think we've got about uh, 20 minutes, actually. Uh, just a reminder, to, if you do have a question, uh, to use the microphones in the aisles. Any questions? Comments? Uh, yes, I have a question. Sure. Uh, for your uh, dashboarding for the consumption of resources, were you making use of the OpenStack Solometer project for that, or did you do something yourselves? Uh, we used a combination of Solometer and uh, Grafana, the data. Grafana. We, Grafana and Kibana. Well, yeah, we used Grafana to, um, to display it, but we, it was a combination of Solometer and some of the data that comes out of the Stacklight monitoring suite. Okay. Um, you know, we kind of customized some of the HECA pipeline to uh, pull stuff off their queues and um, kind of transform the events into messages that uh, we would then display in Grafana. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm assuming you guys do chargebacks to your internal customers? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes we do. So how do you manage them saying, you guys are more than the public cloud providers? What is your response to that? Is it, is it, do you guys have a support from the top down saying, this is the way to go, you guys can't use public clouds, or can you, can you guys talk about that experience? We, we actually want, um, our company direction is to consume public cloud as, as much as possible um, in this hybrid way. Um, ironically, uh, our public cloud is, uh, is more expensive than our on-prem um, chargeback. Um, it's almost, um, and so there's actually an incentive for teams to use our on-prem stuff uh, more so than public. Uh, but, but there's definitely a lot of uh, teams that want to do that hybrid where they're doing their test dev um, internally on-prem right. right. and they're hosting their public SaaS offerings. <laughs> So internally, basically, all of the development and tests within the open, you know, within OpenStack, we do is in our labs, which is not on the internet. However, we produce, you know, promote the soft layer, which is internet facing. And there's obviously a cost when you have it internet facing. So there, that model it does vary, as Chino said. You know, there's the cost internally, and then there's the premium cost to be internet facing because of the security, the firewalls, et cetera, that go with that. And then my uh, other question was, how do you guys bill your uh, your internal customers? Do you same as the public cloud per CPU? Do you give them flat fee? Can you guys talk What's about that? Blue pay? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a little bit varied uh, site to site. Um, we've got a couple different models depending on the geography. There, um, in the US, it's all usage based. So, you know, RAM hours, um, whatever you consume is what you get charged for, um, and that's billed out quarterly. Um, and so just they, they, you can get a view of what you're going to get, end up being paid, you know, charged, but the actual payment doesn't happen um, but four times a year. Whereas, like our European uh, team, they're all burden pool based, so um, and they're kind of shifting away from that. So it's not usage based. It's 
<clears throat> they basically have this team, this is what it costs to run their cloud and run their services, and then that gets split out evenly across all their consumers. But now that we're in this global team you know, dynamic, um, we want to shift everything to, to usage-based. Uh, pay, pay, pay for whatever you use. Thank you. So you mentioned, uh, you made an interesting comment about the count of dynamic instances went up. I'm just a little curious as how have your thoughts shifted on the kind of metrics you're tracking in order to reflect this new pattern that you're endorsing? Yeah, I mean, that is, I think as the people or developers are finding, once again, I go back to, they're enabled, they have a project, they have their instances. We're not, quote, inhibiting them anymore. As they experiment and they do more work, for example, we have a team that's using Kubernetes to do deployments and they find that it's a lot faster for them to develop these sandboxes that the development teams use. And it's something that they can just pick up and throw away. And we capture that, I think, through the, the stack light and through some of these metrics yeah. that we're producing. But, you know, I, I, think, I think with OpenStack, we find there's a new level of thinking and a new level of creativity that the development teams are getting, getting the hang of. Yeah. Just to add on, um, I mean, we do track number of deployments. We, I mean, just historically, we've always tracked that. I don't know how relevant that is, um, to be honest, uh, in this new sort of mindset. Uh, another metric we, we try to really focus on is um, what's the life cycle? So something was created, um, was it, when was it deleted, and, and, and tracking that as one unit. You know, how many recycled um, events happened, uh, and then measuring the time between. So, you know, if it's an average of two weeks, you know, something's, something's not right. They're not, we're not, it's not the behavior we want to drive. Um, and then there's also just, because the, the whole goal is to get um, as dense as possible, as utilized as possible. So then, you know, should, we've also, we're also tracking um, how well are they meeting their quotas? You know, are they hitting 80% of the quota that they've defined, we've defined for their project? Um, and then track that over time. So we're still kind of playing around with the right metrics, but I, I, I don't think we've figured out or the industry's really figured out what's the right a uh, single way to determine you know, how efficient you are and um, how well utilized you are other than you're using up all your resources. And hey there. Um, two part question. How did you calculate your TCO and where specifically did you see the 30% reduction? Uh, so TCO is calculated based on uh, infrastructure capital, um, actual data center, um, uh, racks, server, storage, network equipment, and then the people, uh, the people cost. Um, and we were able to kind of shrink our teams and support um, more capacity, more, more clouds with, with the same number of people. Um, so investing in more automation and kind of changing how we did things kind of reduced our overall cost of people and infrastructure. So essentially in some <clears throat> cases where you have the legacy SAN team, network team, uh, Intel team, application team, that's in one person sometimes. Uh, they do it, that stack engineer, that full stack engineer where we can consolidate all those skills within one to deploy those clouds. So just a clarification question. So the 30% reduction in TCO was largely OPEX based and not CAPEX? Uh, it was a combination. combination. Um, I mean, we're, you want to talk about the CAPEX stuff? I mean, I mean it's the CAPEX. I mean, we have, what, five year over that? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we just try to go for like smaller, more reusable servers, um, yep. and hence the, the, we drove the cost down from that. Um, uh, some of the network equipment uh, going to more um, kind of so appliance-based networking uh, kind of reduced some of that CapEx cost, but the majority is, uh, was OpEx. Thank you very much. So I had a couple questions related to support. And, and what level of support you provide to the end users. So in our environment now, we have some developers using public, we have an internal private cloud, and then we have a, an environment that's, I don't know, we're gonna call it classic, like a traditional VMware environment where you know, people have long running machines, the infrastructure is highly available. So as we've transitioned more into a cloud model, a challenge that we're facing is related to like compliance for patching and vulnerabilities. So mm -hmm. in the older environment, 
there was a lot of hand holding. It was a managed service related to that. They just go to a dashboard. There were teams doing that, but as we move towards more self service, the onus is on them. And initially, in the private space, that didn't work out too well. There's there's more policy in place for the public, so they're mandated more, and machines will get shut down and destroyed. But do you guys have that challenge or any recommendations related to that? So I'm doing a talk on that tomorrow regarding the image compliance and how we use the different tools to basically produce compliant images and help them uh, with those challenges moving forward. Yeah, I mean, if we can talk after if you like, that'd be fine. But yeah, it is a, cha it is a challenge to, in, in the cloud world to you know, keep these images. I mean, and they spin up, so as we see the the usage of all these DevOps, these continuous delivery, continuous integration tools out there, you know, the developments, the developers are in, they're enabled and they're building up these environments, they're doing their testing, they're spinning it up, they're tearing it down and, you know, but at some point when the long lived ones are out there that we have to have that level of patching, we have to have, if it's Windows antivirus and for what business purposes they have to have certain password policies, et cetera. So that's, the challenge we found, may, you know, not saying we solved it, but we made a good uh, step into it. So do you have like agent de agents deployed that you're watching the stuff or do you? So in one of the cases we to, uh, deploy the IBM endpoint manager, which is used to be called big fix, which will basically check the image, you know, for compliance and what have you, and then report back to our compliance engine and when an instance gets deployed within our environment, we have a, uh, a program called IT SAS, which is our IT security compliance. The image basically gets scanned. It gets registered in the compliance tool. The end user gets notified of that. And then whatever patches are due, APARs, they basically get flagged. They get notified via email. And also the endpoint manager is sort of the, quote, overseer to say, hey, wait a minute. We see this vulnerability that just came out you may want to address this sooner than later. Yeah, so for any image that uh, a user will use, the, it'll be compliant out of the, out of the gate. Um, so we maintain the images. We've got a process that automatically uh, keeps them up to date on a monthly basis. Uh, say if a user wants to bring their own image, you know, we've given them a process to go um, upload them through Jenkins, which will scan it, uh, patch it, uh, and then kind of spit out um, a image that's just as good as any of our own images that we provide. Um, so we give them this process. Instead of just importing their own into their own project, they import it into through Jenkins and it gets pushed out into their project and it's compliant out of the box. And then as Bill mentioned, ongoing compliance, uh, we kind of scan it behind the scenes uh, on some cadence to make sure there isn't like uh, vulnerable systems and when there are, they get notified and you know they've got a window to, to patch them or fix them or they have the option to automate that, uh, to, to, to leverage our endpoint manager um, component to do it automatically. Um, so they have the option to do it like every weekend, um, any time, or only when they're notified. Yeah, so, so one thing we're trying to implement is, is to try to have people stop thinking about patching and that they redeploy their infrastructure once something becomes non-compliant. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that we're going to run into some challenges with that. So we have, I, <clears throat> we, we debate back and forth. Do we deploy an agent? I don't want an agent out there. Like, hey, use Ansible to do it. And you need, all right, then I need Tower. You know, how does it scale? You know, so historically we've had agents. There's a policy now that'll say, you know, after two months, all you know, instances that have been instantiated off of this image should be destroyed and rebuilt using somebody's developing like a cloud custodian type tool for OpenStack. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what we're going to do long term, but I know the agent, non-agent, let people manage their own stuff is something that has challenged us so far. So I'd love to hear more during that session tomorrow. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I think we're still got a few more minutes. Hey, um, you talked about that you calculate your TCO and um, you collect the money quarterly. How do you define your prices? Uh, it's all cost recovery. So whatever it costs us to 
provide the service, that's what we end up charging to our users. Is there like a price list for the client by the sizes of the VMs or yep. is it, okay. Yeah, we. Um, it's RAM, RAM CPU. Uh, yeah, I think memory. we've. I think we've actually broke it down to like um, per RAM hour, because we realized it was not any cloud. RAM is like your constrained resource, or your most constrained resource, RAM and IPs. Um, and I think it's, what is it, roughly 10 cents yeah. an hour or right. something? Yep. Um, so we try to break it down to where it aligns with what it costs us to manage and run, run, the, run the offering. Thank you. Hi, being it's an internal uh, deployment, how do you get your future demand? How do you know when you have to add and uh, add capacity? So you're obviously not just going to keep building like some of the cloud server providers will just continually add. How do you measure that? Do you have to go and get clients to give you their like yearly expected deployment, or are you just using historical data? I mean, it's uh, historical data. We're monitoring obviously the in clouds to see where the resource, the consumption is, and as needed, we add resource as needed, but. Um, is there a scientific model to it? Um, no, I'd say no. I think it's looking at the utilization across the board. We tend, I don't tend to get too consumed with instances, instant counts. I'm more concerned about the underlying hypervisors and what they're doing, how they're churning away, and that's the barometer, basically. You get that through the stack light, the monitoring of the, uh, the base metal, the bare metal. Which, even though you try to do as, as good a job planning, there's always going to be cases where yeah. you need unplanned resources. And this is where the hybrid part of the solution actually works out. You know, we'll um, try to cloud burst into our public cloud and provide resources that way. Um, or we shift resource from one, not shift, shift resource, but we shift the user to Workload. another geo where there may be more capacity. I mean, this is where we leverage the multi-cloud approach. Uh, for those unplanned uh, needs. Thank you. So if you don't mind, two questions. Sure. So using a cost recovery model, how often do you go back and revise your pricing structure? And then the next question is, as you've gone through this, have you used metrics for both either utilization or cost recovery that you've later determined to be useless metrics and thrown out, and if so, why? We have revised costs in the past. Um, the more efficient we become, the less costly um, it that it takes. The less cost for us to run the service, um, the the lower the cost to the end user, because uh, we're not trying to make a profit internally. Right. Um, our role is to enable teams and make sure we're doing it at the lowest cost possible. So we have lowered costs in the past. Um, as far as a metric where we kind of hmm. threw away. Um, yeah. I don't know about that one. We, uh, I, I can't recall one that we've kind of given up on totally, um, to be honest. We, we, we try to look as much data as possible. Um, we, used, we used to look at, uh, I mean, we used to track CPU, but <laughs> it hasn't really been CPU utilization. Yeah, really I think the effective. metrics were really, I mean, it's it's the, I think the underlying infrastructure is what we're really, the metrics we look at there, and you know, you go down your memory, CPU, network, uh, some of the key components within the hypervisor, you know, throwing away or looking at other metrics, uh, you know, there could be some things in that area, um, but typically, you know, we stick to the basics on that one. I think we got uh, a couple more minutes. Anything you wanted? Bring up or uh, just said that we, you know, using IBM Spectrum Scale for the backend file storage that is uh, used for our public clouds, our, our private internal clouds, um, fairly robust uh, backend storage used, uh, you know, SAN storage, clustered, redundant, resilient. I think the thinking and doing that. I come from a VMware background. I wanted that clustering file system in the backend so I can easily migrate instances to and from, GPFS provides that for us, and we have a significant amount of GPFS skills within the teams. And just a quick plug, uh, again, Bill is going to be doing a session tomorrow at the Sheraton. Yes. It's one of the late sessions, I think 5.30? Yeah. Um, so, so maybe we the pre-happy hour uh, stop, but uh, we'll, we'll go into kind of details on our custom image um, 
engine um, and that's all driven by Jenkins and uh, it's really cool so if you want to come by then we'll, we'll be there too. All right, if there aren't any questions, thanks for uh, attending and thank you. Have a good week. Thank you.